and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. In the upcoming year and parliamentary session, the government will be tabling its proposed amendments to the constitution to finally allow Malaysian women to confer citizenship to their overseas born children. However, the government is also planning to bundle the um, additional constitutional amendments, uh, constitutional amendments that will remove existing protections running uh, the risk of perpetuating statelessness. Now, despite the outcry against these additional amendments, the government is moving ahead with plans to present its proposal to the Conference of Rulers for their consent in October. Now, to get a better understanding of the impact of these bundled proposed constitutional amendments. Joining us now is Latifa Koya. She's the co-founder of Lawyers for Liberty. Latifa, thank you for joining me on the show. So I hope I got that correct, that there's one constitutional amendment that you know, we've long been fighting for to allow Malaysian uh, mothers to confer citizenship to overseas-born children. But then there are also five other troubling amendments. Uh, these amendments run the risk of perpetuating statelessness. Can you very briefly tell us about those five amendments and what worries you, what concerns you about their specific implications? Hi, hi, Melissa. Yes, um, thank you for having me. And I think uh, we're all just uh, probably still in the dark uh, as to exactly what those amendments are. So I'm not too sure whether it's ex exactly five. It could be more. Um, so what we know of um, all this while were the amendments in relation to the, uh, you know, the addition of the word mother uh, or, or rather parents or uh, to basically remove the gender discrimination against mothers who have uh, given birth to children overseas. Uh, that is not in dispute. That is something that has been an ongoing issue. It's not something that was uh, brought up, uh, uh, you know, the changes of the amendments was not initiated by the current government. It has been ongoing for a long time. So if, uh, eventually, I think uh, when the matter was um, agreed upon uh, sometime late the year before last, um, the minister, the home minister at that time also, uh, we can say reluctantly um, was forced to put the matter at rest by bringing the, the amendment to the uh, Rulers' Council before it can be amended in the parliament. So, yeah, so that was what we know of any potential amendment to the provisions of citizenship. But to our horror, while that was happening and people were asking, um, when are they going to do the amendment? Uh, how long does it take? Uh, because the case is still pending. The appeal case is still pending at the federal court uh, level. Uh, some of the NGOs have discovered that there were other type of amendments that was done in such a sinister manner that we just stumbled upon it and as you know, that when the matter first came out, um, many NGOs, many individuals have come out uh, asking and demanding, "What is what is this about? And how did you come out? Uh, you know, how did you come up with this?" And we made a few um, uh, knowledgeable guesses as to what uh, what the amendments are. So among the worrying ones would be one is the removal of Section One E. I'll elaborate as to what what that uh, what section one e is about. Uh, the other one is the removal uh, of the rights of a foundling to have um, an automatic citizenship, and then the third one is to remove the limb which says when a child is born in this country to either a Malaysian citizen or a permanent resident. Uh, 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 one of the parents are either a Malaysian citizen or a permanent resident, that person, that child will be also uh, considered to be a citizen. Uh, a citizen. So these are the three amendments which um, they are going to remove the right to be citizen automatically. And when that happens, right. the, the effect of it is actually so devastating um, that you will create a huge, uh, a larger set of classes of stateless uh, uh, children or people 
we've already got stateless people, but mm -hmm. this this amendment is going to actually guarantee a larger uh, group of people who will be stateless. Right. So. Uh, Latifa, can I can I just jump in there? I want to focus in on Section One E. That that seems to be the one that has been um, the most troubling because there there is this proposed change from operation of the law to by registration, taking away very um, you know constitutional safeguards uh, safeguards that have been in the constitution since the founding the the formation of malaya if i'm not mistaken can we talk about that the historical context the original intent and inclusion of section 1e is part of the constitution all right okay so what happens is this uh, as you know part 3 of the constitution is all about citizenship okay and one can obtain citizenship in three three uh, manner one is by way of um, naturalization by way of um, registration. That means if someone is married uh, to uh, a, a Malaysian, a foreigner mother, foreigner wife, uh, or the children of a, a Malaysian could register to become a citizen. Naturalization is if they have lived here more than 12 years and then they, you know, basically um, uh, are able to. Uh, make the application from being a permanent resident to become a Malaysian citizen. And both of those uh, categories are by way of discretion of the government, meaning that the government can set a few conditions, uh, put them through an interview, ask them questions and see whether they are fit. And they have the absolute uh, discretion to grant them citizenship or not. But what we are talking about is the category of people who become citizen automatically. Mm -hmm. This is not uh, a, a situation where the government grants citizenship, but this is as of right. So, for example, uh, Melissa, you are born in Malaysia, right? At the age of 12, you would be brought by your parents to, to the JPN to get your my card. Mm -hmm. And the first question that they would see is, where were you born? So you will be shown your birth certificate. And if you are born to a Malaysian parent, either one of your parents are Malaysian, you're born in this country, then you will be entitled to be a, a Malaysian citizen as of right. So you're not actually applying to be a citizen, but you are just demanding a my card, which will confirm your citizenship. All right. So that's that's the part. So how do you then decide whether you will fall into this category or not, or, or, or that category? So in that context, um, we have what you call Article 14. So people who are given citizenship by operation of law. And when you say by operation of law means automatically citizen. So there are various categories under the schedule within the uh, federal constitution, the second schedule. And there's one uh, whole part which is all about those who were born before Malaysia Day. All right. Uh, that's history for, for, a long, for, for a long time now. Let's focus on those who are born after Malaysia Day. So that would be people who are like those who are born in Malaysia after Malaysia Day. If they fall in category 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D or 1E. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so that, that was, that's how we have been uh, talking about citizenship as of right. Now, uh, if you know the controversy of mothers who have children born overseas, the controversy came about where there is a section called Section C and Section B. These two sections or these two provisions are for people who are born overseas. Okay, so when the for those uh, persons who are born overseas to a father who is Malaysian, that child will be considered. Malaysian as of right. But that is that is where the, the controversy is. Why is it limited to the father? So now with the amendment, you can say that finally, even mothers who have, you know, who are Malaysian will be able to um, uh, uh, demand for the, uh, be granted for uh, as automatic uh, citizen. Then let's talk about um, uh, D. Now, D is about those who are born in Singapore. Now, those who are born in Singapore, they say either parents uh, who are Malaysian can be considered Malaysian, uh, not can be considered, will be considered automatically, right? So not an issue. They are planning to remove it, but it makes no much difference because 
it's still born overseas, so you can fall under B, uh, B or C. Then comes 1E. So those who do not fall in either A or B or C or D, the sentence in E, unlike the first one, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, where everything refers to parents, a reference to the parents, E just says, if a person is born in this country, not a citizen of any other country, then this person will be considered citizen by operation of law in Malaysia. So what kind of what kind of persons would be these who fall under E? So if I do not know my parents, for example, the origins of my parents, I'm an orphan in, in, a, in, in, a, in, in an orphanage, for example, and I don't know the origin of my parents, where do I fall? All I know is that, that as a baby, I grew up in this orphan, right? Uh, in this orphanage. So I will be considered stateless. So if I'm stateless, because if you say any, if not a citizen of any other country, that actually means I'm stateless, right? So right. if I'm stateless, then I should be, the minute I could show that I'm stateless, then I should be entitled to be a citizen of this country. So this is the okay. protection clause that protects so, so, someone from being stateless. So Latifa, the, the, the category of the, the group of people that will be most impacted are already the most vulnerable of children in society. I, I'm trying to understand why include these amendments, the justification for tightening national security, for controlling population. Uh, how, how do we think about that? Do you see flaws in the Home Ministry's justification for these proposed amendments? Well, well it's actually mind-boggling. It's baffling as to how they came out with these um, amendments because there was no push for such amendments, um, you know, there was no real push to uh, ask for amendments. The amendments for the discrimination against mothers was clear. People were asking for fairness and, and being uh, part of uh, CEDAW, uh, we were a signatory, we are a signatory to CEDAW. So of course you have to go, uh, you have to uh, be consistent with what you have signed for. So similarly, um, there was no, that you know nothing that actually demands for any other amendments and the worst part is that amendment is not to bring any anything better but worse it, had they uh, actually amended uh, the provision which gives an interpretation that a child who was born out of wedlock will have to follow only the mother uh, that if you are going to amend it to make it more fair so that the child will actually be able to claim um, citizenship through the father, then we can say that's good. Finally, uh, an illegitimate child is not being punished, right? But mm -hmm. that there was no amendment for that. But instead, you are going for the most vulnerable, like you said. And uh, it, it's actually it's amazing because this is something that has been spoken about for so many years. The government has not been applying the the provision rightfully so we have so many people who are waiting to actually be granted citizenship not by way of application but to be uh, what you call acknowledged their citizenship that that has not happened so you can you there will be, there are literally thousands of people who's who's been waiting for years and years only for this only to be recognized as a as a citizen out of as of right so this is the problem that we are facing so can you imagine when they take away such a provision, where are they going to go? It's not a situation where we're talking about a foreign mother uh, who was born in this country, uh, who gave birth to in, in this country. Let's say she traveled and she came into this country and she gave birth, right? That child does not uh, and, uh, automatically become a Malaysian citizen. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, uh, uh, go that way. So the argument of national security does not make sense. If you can recall, uh, Melissa, uh, probably a year ago, the government, a year ago or two, the government was trying to show that children who are born to Malaysian mother and foreign father overseas are national security. 
they were using that argument when they were trying to push it uh, away before the decision of the court, but they were trying to make that argument. But since then, they have actually decided they will have to make that amendment, right? Mm -hmm. So how is it that something from a national security became, it's fine, it's safe, they're no longer a security threat. But now you're talking about poor orphans, and then there are more, there are more vulnerable situations. Like for example, um, we just spoke about 1E, right? Let me just touch a bit on foundling, section 19B, right. which which is also a situation where you're going to make that a child who was born uh, or fo found uh, abandoned, not knowing uh, his or her biological uh, mother, right? If a child is a, a abandoned, say in a hospital or anywhere, uh, a baby hatchet, for example, or dumped in a in a in an orphan at the, at the door of the orphanage, right? So, what happens to that foundling? That foundling is to be presumed under the current provision, Section 19B says, that foundling is to be presumed to have been born to a mother who is permanently residing there, which means that child is automatically Malaysian yeah. based on the provision, right? But they are going to amend it and say that child or that foundling will now will be at the discretion of the government whether to give or not. So again, you take away another as of right citizenship and make that child wait and you know beg and and hope for the kindness maybe 20 years later the child comes out in the tv and makes a sad story before that child can be considered a uh, malaysian that's mm -hmm. how horrible and cruel this whole thing is so that's right. section 19 and right. uh, Latifa, we're yes. running out of time um uh, this this is a conversation we will continue and we will be speaking to Hartini Zainuddin the co-founder of Yayasan Chowkit and she does a lot of work with foundlings as well we'll get her thoughts on this uh, thank you so much for speaking with me Latifa Koya from Lawyers for Liberty we're going to take a quick break and consider this we'll be back with more Hi, welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. The Home Ministry is moving ahead with its proposed amendments to remove existing constitutional protections that were meant to prevent children from becoming stateless. Safeguards that have been in place since Malaya was formed. Joining us now is Dr. Dr. Hartini Zainuddin. She's a co-founder of Yayasan Chowkit Tini. I appreciate you joining me today. I want to zoom in on some of the language in this proposed um, amendments. In your work, you have witnessed firsthand the struggles faced by foundlings, by children born out of wedlock, by um, adopted children, children who are born to stateless parents, all of these vulnerable children. Can you tell me how you expect um, the changing the phrase of by uh, operation of the law to by registration, how that will impact these children um, practically, in, in, how does it work in practice? So if you're talking about 19B um, mm -hmm. and the foundlings ruling, um, so this whole operations by law to registration actually means that a law that has already been in, in place since um, in the federal constitution is now going to be amended to sort of be, the meaning is, is literally um, it, the, um, at the discretion of the Home Minister. So it's going to be very subjective. It is not automatic. And even though, you know, the law has not been implemented um, throughout um, all the processes that I've been, so in some cases, you know, it has been implemented in some, there's an, there is that law that actually says you have to protect foundlings. Um, when you take that law away, and say that it is now at the discretion of the Home Minister, that protection is gone, but then it becomes subjective, yeah? Uh, and it's not automatic. So, you know, I, I'm, I, I really like this Home Minister. I, I really, really do. I think he's trying really hard, but what, what happens when he leaves? And what happens if something else, if someone else comes in? Um, are they going to have the same standards? Are they going to, 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 to you know, understand what, 
best interests of the child is. The truth of the matter is um, the minister, the home ministers have been very subjective in terms of who they give and how they give it. And it is not standardized. We don't know uh, what the criteria is. We don't know why some get um, some get approved and some don't. So it's really dicey when you take away an automatic right um, and to citizenship and that protection, take that protection away um, in total and then say, oh, now it's an up to the Home Minister. We just cannot take those chances, especially with the number of children and the fact that when you take away this um, this, this right, um, you leave the children totally vulnerable. They have nothing here. Registration and citizenship is the best way to protect children. You cannot take that away from them. Right. So, Tini, the Home Minister has actually cited Sabah as uh, an example for the, of the need for these uh, constitutional amendments. He cited residents who have lived in Sabah could be granted a permanent residency after living, living there for some time, and then their children will get automatic citizenship. That was one of the justifications. I think there's also the use of national security as a justification, the, the fear of opening the floodgates as justification. H how, how do you read this? What, what do you see as flaws in using um, this argument as justification for the proposed amendments? This floodgates, I'm going to address the most ridiculous among its first. Um, this floodgate myth um, and the barbarian at the gates. Um, never in the history of mankind has there ever been any floodgates and barbarians waiting at the at the, at the borders, rushing in um, to ensure that they get citizenship if their children get citizenship. It's never happened. First of all, as the as the Home Ministry has pointed out, um, citizenship is a privilege in this country. It's not an automatic right. You choose right who you give the citizenship to um and it's not transferable so so if you have a child who is stateless who has been determined to be families because the investigative process is long yeah it's two years three years four years five there is an intensive in investigative process that goes through this so you have to determine if this child's a foundling or if a child has applied for citizenship that a they don't have parents right or they're being adopted by malaysian parents or they have nobody right and and are therefore guaranteed uh, protection and citizenship under the law in that sense you still have to, to scrutinize because it's not implemented um, sub, um objectively right across the board and it's not standardized um and if they if that child is given citizenship the, the the biological parents cannot jump out from behind the tree. I'm sorry, this is how ridiculous it is, you know, and say, hey, you have now given my biological scrutinized unless, you know, unless there's some flaw in the system that I don't know about because it takes forever. You know, my own daughter took 11 years and she's a foundling, right? And she was a, a victim of, of baby selling, etc. 11 years. Um, so it's a very intensive process. There are no barbarians at the gates. It is, citizenship is not transferable. And as far as, you know, permanent residents go, there's a reason why they're called permanent residents, right? You can prove that they have lived here and they have right to abode and been here for a long, long time. Why are we taking away their citizenship of their children? It, it, it's, it's, it's just unfathomable because you would think the national security threat is if you take away their citizenship and you deny them citizenship, then you deny them all the basic needs. Then they have no tie to the land, right? There's your national security threat. There is your no access to health, no access to school. Oh my goodness, you're now vulnerable to, you know, whatever, right? Because you don't teach them the right thing. That's your national security threat. So I think, it, I think, I don't know the culture with the Home Ministry, but it seems to be parroting over decades since I know that I've been working on this issue for like 15, 20 years. They parrot the same exact words. So I don't know, it's like, you know, a manifesto when you go into the Home Ministry where, you know, they repeat the same thing over and over again without really understanding or thinking about what they're saying because it's in conflict with one another many times. Okay, very quickly, Tini, what would you like to see happen next? Because we understand that this has to be endorsed by cabinet before it goes through the conference. Well, it doesn't, I want to see that it never goes to parliament. <laughs> there is no endorsement. There is no reason to 
introduced regressive laws, the laws are fine by itself. Our forefathers and the federal constitution made sure that there are guidelines of protection. There's a reason why we don't sign, you know, the convention to reducing statelessness because we already have it within our federal constitution. We don't need to protect our citizens and they are our citizens for all intents and purposes. No need. Don't don't need to introduce all these amendments. Okay, Tini, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Dato' Dr. 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 Hartini Zainuddin of Yayasan Chowkit wrapping up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.